right, what's up guys? What's up, what's up, what's up? I am very excited to be here today. Uh, this is a very special day because it finally happened. Uh, I was waiting for a long time for this to happen and uh, I ran out of my regular black sweatshirts. So you can see today I'm rocking one of my favorite sweatshirts. The Weird Al Yankovic live tour, no strings attached. It's got the uh, really cool guitars and stuff up here, instruments up here inside the hoodie. One of my favorite sweatshirts. It's funny, there's no strings attached, and actually there are no strings here, but uh, that's uh, that was the name of the tour, No Strings Attached. So he did this tour because he had a uh, an entire orchestra behind him, a stringed orchestra, you know, a 200-piece orchestra or whatever it was. I don't know how many people were there, but he had a bunch of people behind him, uh, and... So, I finally ran out of sweatshirts, regular black hooded sweatshirts that I normally wear, my normal work uniform, and, uh, and uh, that's it. That's what today is. Today is a very special day because of that. All right, <clears throat> let's go, let's go, let's go. Andy Venom says, love the series so far. Thank you very much, Andy Venom. I'm very glad that you are enjoying it. Um, I also kind of uh, overlooked something that I probably should have thought about before, uh, which is that the images of the bass guitar would probably be very helpful for anyone who is interested in following along. So I did throw them up on my IMGUR uh, this morning. So uh, I will drop a link to these images in the description. Um, and let me see if this link here will... Let me just give you everything all at once. Uh, hopefully this will let me give you everything all at once here. Let's see what happens. Let's see. So if one of you guys wants to give that link a try, I just dropped it in the... Uh, what's it called? The chat? I just dropped it in the chat. So if you want, one of you guys wants to give that a try and just confirm that you can see all... You know, whatever. I think there's eight images in here. Um, that way, if you want to follow along with from home, you are able to. Uh, this final image here, it just happened to be in that folder, and so I threw it in there just because, um, well, I threw, really, I threw it in there by accident, but I thought you might think it's interesting to see the way that the um, uh, truss rod works. So the truss rod here, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, it's, uh, it's basically a solid piece of metal going across the top, and then a threaded piece of metal here and here. I think it's just threaded at one end. I don't think it needs to be threaded at the other end. Um, and then what happens is when you tighten that threaded section, it causes the um, it causes the metal to bow in one direction or the other direction. Um, and then that causes the neck to bow in that same direction. And this is something we have to do when we're setting up guitars uh, because if you don't do this, then you will... Um, You'll get fret buzz, really. That's what happens. The, the frets, the neck is intended to be bent just slightly. Um, and if you don't have that, then you won't be able to play the guitar because the when you press down on the strings in the lower section of the neck, they'll buzz the whole way up the neck. Um, there are ways around it if you don't have a truss rod, a functional truss rod, but a uh, truss rod is the uh, is the ideal solution. So, all right, thank you very much to uh, to Anti Venom and to Tambor Station. Good to hear that everything is there and working. <clears throat> So let's get into it here in uh, in SolidWorks. We're going to we're going to jump in and take a look at SolidWorks here and we're going to take a look at uh, my favorite build of SolidWorks which is SolidWorks 2015. So let me just get the assembly open, flip over to our keyboard cam. I did put the mask right here in the background of the keyboard cam, so I thought you guys might like that. Uh, I just think it looks awesome to have that mask kind of looking down on us and uh, you know, just Making sure that everybody's staying in line, nobody's getting too crazy in the chat. So I hope you guys enjoy that throughout the presentation today. I'm very happy with how that is framed. Uh, so let's get into it here. We're going to talk about, actually speaking of framing, let me just move this a little. Oh, look, we can get the mask in that frame too. That's nice. 
a little double mask action. So uh, let's get into it here today, and let's talk. Let's pick up right from where we left off yesterday. Like I said yesterday, I'm not going to do a recap any longer. Uh, I've been doing the recaps, and and uh, I think that they are not necessary. So I'm not going to do the recap any longer, and we're just going to get right into it here and talk about uh, what you know what what we can do to continue with this design. Now, our goal today is going to be to go through and and maybe um, create the fretboard. Uh, I said I might create the truss rod today, and, and I still might do that. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll do the truss rod as well. But before we get into any of that, I just wanted to look at the neck itself. And uh, uh, Andy Venom says, looks like Rey Mysterio. Yeah, yeah, nice. Good call, bro. Um, so it, if I want to just look at the neck itself, and I want to just uh, compliment myself and say, wow, the back of the neck down here looks awesome. Like, I am very happy with how this turned out. You could look at that, and you could say, like, yeah, that's a guitar neck. That looks awesome. When real view is on, you're getting the, re the reflection off the shiny wood. Yeah, that looks superb i'm very happy with how that turned out i think that's that's great that's you know it's perfect it's exactly what i wanted um but when it comes to this section up here i'm not nearly as happy uh there's i think that my beef with this section up here and let me just open up this neck into its own window so we can look at this together i think there's just not enough curve here and what I mean is if we look at this thing in wireframe and then we show the image of the neck from the side, we can see that the, the image has a lot more curve down in this, this region here where the version that we made yesterday is just a little too like sharp. Like it just goes from here to here to here. Boom. Done. So I wanted to go back and revisit that. I'm just not happy with it. It doesn't look like what the physical model looks like. You know, a lot of times these things, you want to kind of sleep on it. You want to think about it. Maybe you go back and, and you keep working on it the next day. And, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. And so what I think we could maybe do here is change our approach to that blend. And there's going to be a couple of changes that we make to our approach to that blend. But one of the things that I was thinking about was the blend is going from here to here. Um, and it's going from, you know, a, a, a shape that has some curvature on it to a shape that's just, you know, just sharp. Now, in the actual neck, uh, what we can see is that it, it kind of, like, if you look at this shape right here, what that shape says to me is variable radius fillet. Like, it looks like a very small radius down here. And then it grows to a larger radius. Like it, it looks like a cone that's running around that curved edge. And so when I, you know, when I was thinking about it last night, I was thinking maybe a better approach uh, instead of just going from a rigid sharp face to a rigid sharp face, maybe a better approach would be to try to work in a variable radius on this face, on this region here first and then create my my lofted shape. So that was thing one that I thought about. And then the second thing that I thought about was um, w when we're looking at this from from this end here, we have to just make sure that our, our geometry is gonna line up in the sense that if I do a convert entities here, like you see how that is lopping off the corner here? Well, that's not gonna work. You know, that, that, that's not going to work for what we're trying to accomplish. And I know that we're trying to set ourselves up so that we have uh, uh, basically a sharp that's taking place right here. Uh, but unfortunately, that's, you know, because of how I designed this thing, that's basically where the intersection of these two uh, curves is going to be. And, and what I mean when I say that's not going to work is if, you know, if I was to take another line here and try to create some kind of a, a tangency that runs down to here, you know, it's not going to work. It's not going to, I'm not going to be able to do it. The only thing I could really do would be to do something like this. And I think that that's part of the reason also we were getting failures when we went to create that loft is because it's not really, you know, it's going to be tough to come off of here tangent and come off of here tangent and, and get the nice smooth curve that we want. So I think when I did that move face uh, to, to clean up this region and to give myself a little bit more room to work with, I think that was a mistake. Um, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to just uh, get rid of that move face. Uh, I'm going to suppress it for now, but I'm probably going to end up deleting it. I'm only suppressing it for now just to uh, give myself a way back to it if I happen to want it again. Not like it's a big, big deal to recreate that feature. But if I do a convert entities now and I bring these together, you can see now I'm able to get, you know, a lot more what I want. And I, and I realize that I might not be able to get the sharp to take place exactly at this point. 
but it's going to be close enough. And so what I'm going to be able to do here is, uh, you know, put in some type of a, a you know, hopefully a, a relatively sharp region here like so. So Antivenom says, would using a spline there be useful? So that's a great question, Antivenom, and uh, let's take a look. I mean, again, we can test this. Uh, we can, you know, we can kind of see what uh, this might look like if we were to do it with a spline. So let's go and create, let's go create these two convert entities. We'll take a spline and put it between them. So spline, spline, and then we'll say we want this to be tangent here, and we'll say we want this to be tangent here. And so even if we were to kind of roll this back, you can see that w whenever you have a spline, you can right mouse button, you can say show curvature combs, and then you can increase the, the scale and the density of the curvature combs. And you can kind of see what's going on. And I think that regardless of what we uh, try to do with the, let me make this dark so we can see what's going on here. It's, okay, there we go. So regardless of what we do with the spline handles, we're gonna get what's called an inflection point in that spline. Um, and that's really not what we want. What we want is we want the spline to have more of a shape like this, where if we do show curvature combs, see, that's what we want. We want we don't want there to be an inflection. We don't want tangency to go from positive to negative, or in this case, from negative to positive. It doesn't really matter. The point is when tangency crosses over that neutral flat point, you have what's called an inflection point. And what we want is we want a smooth transition to go from here up to uh, where we're going to be crossing over to the uh, the remainder of the neck. So I think that's what was causing us so many hiccups yesterday. So let's let's try it with a different approach here. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to do here with this different approach is when I created the loft yesterday, what I did was I created a sketch here and I did a split entities on the sketch to, to give me the results that I want. I think today what I'm going to do instead is use an actual split line that runs across this face here. And we're going to see if we get better results. Now, that does mean that we're going to be splitting up this face. And there may be some downstream ramifications to that. So we'll we'll examine examine that as well, particularly when we get down to the fillets. But let's just take a look here. I think we're going to, you know, first of all, we're going to have the opportunity to see some new functionality that maybe we haven't seen before. And uh, second, I think we're going to end up just with better results from this thing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to approach the uh, the filleted section here in the headstock. And we're going to start out by putting some fillets on the corners of this headstock at, you know, maybe like 60 thou going around the corners of this headstock. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. I could get out a radius gauge and measure it, but frankly, I don't think it really matters that much. You know, it's something that we're we're going to be designing our own bass guitar. You know, maybe if we wanted to go a little more, have them even more rounded off. You know, I think that looks kind of cool. It looks fine. Um, it, it's an aesthetics thing uh, as well as a safety thing, right, to a degree. You don't want to have, like, sharp points on the corners of your guitar because you'll bang that into somebody else or bang it into the wall or, you know, damage, maybe even damage the headstock if it's a sharp corner. So lots of reasons to have those rounded off. And now we're going to go to a variable fillet command. So we'll say we're going to do another fillet here, this time variable fillet, and that's going to be applied to this edge and this edge. And the variable fillet is going to start out relatively large, let's say a quarter inch here. And we'll say quarter inch here as well. And then it's going to be tapered down to something a little smaller, like 30 thou around the, the top section of this guitar. So that, I think, looks better. This could maybe even get a little bit larger uh, to kind of match up with what we saw in the uh, in the physical model. So let's say you make this like 0.35 to match that up more with what we're seeing in the physical model. So that, I think, looks a lot more like what we looked at, what we saw on the, the actual headstock, where it starts out as a smaller radius and then it comes out and gets a little bit larger there. So now, let's see what we can do about blending that into our the, the remainder of our neck in this region here. So now what we're going to do is, instead of creating a sketch here and doing a split entities on the sketch, we're going to create a new plane so we're going to take the top plane here and we're going to we're going to control drag the top plane down a certain distance let's say we make that like 0.25 and what this distance is it doesn't it doesn't really matter um it just matters that we you know it looks good aesthetically and we'll see what it looks like when we blend it into uh, the rest of the geometry as well and then we're going to create another plane that's down here closer to the bottom like let's say 0.35 uh, that's a little bit closer to the bottom maybe this 0.25 could be a little bit uh more so let's say it's 0.2 little bit a little bit less uh uh deep there what's up brad welcome welcome thanks for tuning in again great to see you in here and what's up everybody how's everybody doing 
All right, so what are we trying to accomplish here? Well, what we're trying to accomplish is the creation of a loft that has one, two, three, four, five segments. One, two, three, four, five segments that's going into a loft that also has one, two, three, four, five segments. So the way that we're going to accomplish this, let me go view, display, tangent, edge, and phantom so we can see where edges are that are tangent. The way we're going to accomplish this is we're going to go to the command curves split line and we're going to take this plane that we created, the first plane that we created, and this face here. And wherever those two entities are intersecting, so we're using the option for intersection here, we want to create an artificial, uh, an artificial curve. So in other words, uh, this is a, or an artificial edge, I should say. So this is an edge that exists at the intersection of two faces, but it's not changing the topology of either of those faces. We're just injecting a new edge there. And what that accomplishes is now we have one, two, three entities that we're going to loft into five entities. So let's click on that lower plane and we're going to go curve, split line, intersection, and we're going to pick this face down here. And now we have a total of one, two, three, four, <laughs> selection bar is getting in the way, uh, five, five edges that are going to be lofted into five edges. So ideally, when we go to the loft command and we pick this face here and this face here, we can see that we're getting now a much smoother blend. Now, if you go down to the check mark option in the loft command, which is for, let me move this over just a little. The check mark option here, which is for merge tangent faces, if you uncheck that, then you're gonna see the actual connectors between these different faces. So let's uncheck that option. Don't merge the tangent faces. And I was expecting the preview to actually show me uh, the connectors. The other thing you can always do is you can do a right mouse button and you can say show all connectors. And uh, that, in theory, will also show you the connectors. Uh, I don't know why neither of these options is working right now. So let me just hit the green check mark and then I'm going to edit that feature. <laughs> and we'll see if we get, okay, there we go. Now we got the feedback we were hoping for. <laughs> So you can see here the result is uh, very much what we were hoping for. Uh, we're going from this this point up out to this point. We're going from this point out to this point. We're going from this point out to you know all the points that we created from that split split geometry are connecting to all the points that we created from that variable radius fillet. So I think this is already looking pretty good. But really the uh, the icing on top is to go to our start end constraints. And once we go to the start end constraints, we can say here that we want this to be tangent to face, which means that all of the geometry that in the loft that's coming off of this, uh, the, the, the face that I selected here is going to be tangent to all of the outside faces of that uh, body, essentially. So we're going to get full tangency all the way around there. And then we're going to do the same thing here with our second face. So we're going to say tangency to face. And now once again, all of the, the faces are blending out tangent, blending out tangent, blending out tangent, and we can hit the green check mark and take a look at the results. And so now I think we're getting a lot closer to uh, what we were hoping for. Let's go to our options. We'll go document properties, image quality. Let's drive this up even further. We're going to the red zone for the image quality. We really want this to be nice and uh, smoothed out geometry. And uh, let's take a look at this thing from the side view and I just think that looks so much better in that region. It's it's such a nice curve, so much nicer of a, a set of geometry there. And of course, if we were concerned about this geometry, which we're not even going to see, the only reason we're really seeing that right now is because we've uh, we've got our tangent edges displayed in uh, in a, a phantom font. But if we were concerned about that, what do we do? We just edit the definition of this plane that we offset and we bring it back a little bit more so let's say we go back to 0 0.15 and um looks like when that happened i lost the definition of that lower one um i've seen that happen before let's merge that back together let that rebuild and there we go and so now you can see it's not not nearly as extreme of a transition and similarly we could adjust the uh variable radius fillet we can maybe bring that, you know, we went out to 0.35. We could bring that back to, say, 0 0.3, you know, bring that down a little bit as well. And I think you guys get the point here. Um, it's a it's a much 
uh, it's it's a iterative iterative process. It's, you iterate your solution there, but you can see here that we ended up with what I think is a much better result compared to what we had yesterday. Um, and I think that we can confirm that by viewing this thing in, uh, let's go view, display, tangent edges removed. So now we don't have those tangent edges anymore. Let's go to wireframe and then let's show that image again. And look at that. It just looks so much better. It actually, you know, follows that curve a lot more than what we had before. Before it was kind of like straight and then over and it just, it looked kind of funky and uh, I wasn't really digging the results. Now you can see that we have a much better result uh, from that loft. So, you know, you guys, you guys can think what you want, but I see that uh, Anti Venom says pretty smooth. A T A E M says nice. Gives me the that is nice symbol. And uh, Brad says nice. Thank you, thank you. And the Emerja says hello, hello Emerja. How are you? Great to see you in here. But yeah, I just think that's a much better result. I think it looks a lot more like what we had yesterday. It's a lot less wrinkly. Uh, I felt like what we had yesterday was there was a lot of wrinkling going on here in that transition section. And uh, yeah, overall, I think I'm, I'm really happy with that. You know, I might even consider bringing that bottom plane down a little further uh, just to give me a little bit even even less of a, you know, a, a abrupt transition here. But I'm not going to beat that up anymore today. I know there's a lot more functionality we want to look at today. So um Let's hide that image from the side and let's roll forward and see uh, what else we need to do here. So I'm going to rename some of this stuff. So this is going to be called uh, plane for neck split line uh, upper, I'll call this upper instead of one, and then control A, control C, click on this next one, F2, control V, and we'll call this one lower. And then we'll call this one uh, neck split line upper, control A, control C. Click on this one, F2, Control V, call this one lower. So I'm doing that Control A to select all, and then the Control C for copy, and then Control V for paste. And uh, then we're going to go to this bottom one here. We're going to rename this one uh, Neck to Headstock. And maybe I'll just call it, I'll type Loft in the beginning. Loft, Neck to Headstock. And now this other Loft that we created, we really don't need anymore, obviously. So we'll delete that and delete the absorbed sketch that's in that feature. And we'll go down to our fillets, the outer corners of the headstock. F2, control C for, for copy, delete that. And then we can uh, drop that one in here. So F2, control V for paste, fillet, outer corners of headstock. Uh, let's see here, fillets, bottom of headstock, control C, uh, delete that. And then go up here to our variable fillet. And I'll just call, I'll leave this ver fillet in here. And then I'll call it ver fillet, uh, bottom of headstock. And let's see here, now we have the fillets which are at the side sl sides of neck slash lower neck so now uh we're maybe running into a little bit of an issue here let's take a look and see what's what's going on with this issue and this may be a result of us splitting that face oh it looks like it's really just it's just bulking because it's missing an edge so we'll just pick that edge there and i think we also want i think we also want this to be part of that fillet oh wow that runs it all the way down to the bottom that actually looks okay. I don't. I don't actually mind that that much. Um, I think I'm going to stick with that. This is another one of these faces that I might consider doing with a um, one of those face fillets with cord length. I think that might actually end up looking a little bit better up in that region. But I'm going to leave it go for now. Um, and then fillets neck to side pocket. So I think that was originally these edges, which I just captured in uh in this final fillet here so i think i just don't need that fillet anymore delete that and then we finally we finished up with our truss rod pocket which we created at the end of the day yesterday control seven uh let's go back to our standard plain white i like that plain white and oh that's kind of interesting what's going on there still have a hard edge there hmm not sure if i like that too much See, that should have come off tangent when we did our loft. I think I'm just going to leave that one for now. Um, I think, you know, the, again, knowing the manufacturing process, knowing that that's going to be uh, blended by hand, uh, ultimately, I think that, you know, I'm going to be able to give the machinist enough to, uh, to machine this thing with what I've got. So I don't really like that hard edge being there. Um, this kind of shows the advantage of showing your tangent edges uh, removed because you can really quickly pick out if there's anything that didn't quite come out tangent. 
But uh, I think for now, I'm going to leave it because I know that in the uh, manufacturing process, they're going to blend that out by hand. So, so let's save that. And uh, as always, let's uh, let's do a check in here. Always good to check this geometry in when you when you're making changes. So we'll check in that neck, and that way we can kind of over time, you know, with a PDM system over time, you're able to see the entire history of that part. It's kind of cool. You can kind of see how it started with just the headstock, and then you can see that it. Then we added the, you know, the the neck itself. Then we just kind of focused on working on the neck and getting that blend, and then we got into blending the neck to the headstock, um, and then we ended up putting in the truss rod and then making another change to the headstock. I mean, even in that, just flipping between those previews, you can see how much better uh, the headstock looks now with the, that change. So I'm really happy with that change. I think we are in a good spot to move forward with this design. So what should we do next? Well, we could certainly work on the um, truss rod, you know, the truss rod assembly. Uh, but I think that, you know, at this point, maybe uh, what I'd want to do is is start working on. Um, man, I'm kind of like torn here. Like I do want to do the truss rod uh, just to get it, you know, get it done, get it out of the way. Uh, but I also want to work on the. Um, I also want to work on the fretboard da, 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 da. all right let's just stick let's just do the work right let's just keep moving forward so we're gonna go here to the assembly uh, let's save this assembly and I think at this point maybe this is a good time to turn the neck into a neck sub assembly so I'm gonna right mouse button here and I'm gonna say form new sub assembly uh, I'm gonna need to give this a name so this is gonna be R B G and then this is my first sub assembly so I'll call this 2001 and I'll call this one neck Subassembly, because the next is going to have a lot of stuff on it as a subassembly. Um, now we can see here that we're going to run into a couple of issues when we do this. We can see we're going to get this uh, in place warning and this in place warning warning features that will be affected. And we have this in place two, in place three. And so we're going to uh, move these components into this subassembly and then we'll deal with that in place, uh, those in place errors. So we're going to say move and that's going to give us a new subassembly. Now, where does this subassembly need to be located? It needs to be located exactly on the origin with the front top and right plane exactly aligned with the front top and right plane. Fortunately, that is the default behavior. So all I really need to do now is just fix this subassembly. So right mouse button fix, and now the subassembly is fixed in place. Now we open the subassembly, and this is where things get a little tricky uh, because what I prefer to do in this scenario is I prefer to take this component, our master model layout, and just drop it into the subassembly as well as the first component in the subassembly. This is a technique that I've used often and it, and it always works out well for me. So here I am in the next subassembly and what I'm gonna do is insert component and I'm gonna insert the master layout part directly onto the origin of this assembly. That'll be the first part in my assembly. The neck headstock will be the second part and it will be fixed. The problem here is that you run into issues when you've got uh, multiple references, when you've got multiple external references in an assembly. And uh, it's particularly with uh, when it comes to one single component. And so what I mean by that is when we've got this neck component and the neck component has, a, has references and those references are to the very top level assembly, um, I'm going to run into problems when I try to create references uh, from that neck to the master level, you know, in the sub assembly. And uh, the, the correct solution to this really, unfortunately, is to anticipate creating sub assemblies and create the sub assembly first and then bring the sub assemblies together at the higher level assembly. Now, that doesn't really help me in this spot because I've already created all this geometry. I don't want to you know, go back and recreate all the geometry. So unfortunately, I just have to remember that if I'm going to make any additional references between the RGB neck and the uh, uh, master model layout sketch, that I have to remember to do that at the top level assembly. In fact, if I try to edit this part now, I'll probably get a warning. Uh, and the warning will probably tell me that I can't create any references to external geometry. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. So if I take this and hold control and take this and make that coincident. No, oh, it actually worked. That's interesting. Let's see if I do a select chain convert and extrude. Just this is just curiosity here. Yeah, no problems. All right. 
Well, I was expecting that to bulk. I mean, there is one option in your system options that does allow for multiple uh, simultaneous external references, and that is under, let's see here, t -t -t external references, I believe. External references. Ah, I have it turned on. Wonderful. So when you have this option turned on, um, th the problem that you can run into is you can do an A equals B, and you can do a B equals C, and you can do a... B, sorry, a C equals A. And that, of course, is what we lovingly refer to as a, um, a circular reference. So A equals B and B equals C and C equals A. That's what we call a circular reference. And these can be um, very uh, performance intensive. If you have an assembly that has a circular reference in it, when the assembly goes to open, SolidWorks tries to solve and resolve and solve and resolve and solve and resolve. And it can, it can be the culprit when you have an assembly that takes a very long time to open. And so this option up here at the top, allow multiple uh, contexts for parts when editing an assembly, is designed to prevent that. It's designed to not let you do that. Um, and so if that option is not checked, which is the, the default behavior is that it is not checked, and I attempt to do the same thing I did a moment ago. So let me delete this thin feature and its absorbed features. And now let me try again. So select this face, begin a sketch, and then right mouse button, select chain, convert. See, now the convert doesn't work. Nothing showed up in the box here. And the reason nothing is showing up in the box here is because when I attempt to uh, create a reference to something in this assembly, it says cannot, let's see if I can zoom in on that. Okay, cool, let me. It says, cannot use selection. Al allowing this selection would create conflicting contexts. So a moment ago, I did this and it worked fine. And now I did it and it didn't work. And why is that? It's because of that option. Um, so, you know, that's the uh, the solution. Uh, the solution is you just turn on that option if you want to have multiple in-context references. But you have to be careful. You can definitely, you know, design yourself into a corner. You can definitely put yourself in a spot where you've created uh, external references inadvertently, and uh, that can end up causing a lot of problems in your assemblies and a long rebuild time. So, you know, that's the cool thing about this this uh, this training session that we're doing here is that we get to really dive into some of these uh, kind of real world scenarios where you're, you know, you're not going to necessarily learn this stuff in like essentials training. You're not going to necessarily learn this. Even in the assembly training, you might not really understand what that option does. Uh, so hopefully now, you know, now you do a little bit more. Really what I should have done, I'll tell you what I should have done, is I should have created a new sub-assembly for the body. And I should have created a new sub-assembly for the neck. And then I should have brought those two sub-assemblies together at the top level. And in each of those sub-assemblies, I should have brought in this master model uh, layout part. And then for those of you that are interested in drawings, when we right mouse button on the master model layout part and we go to its properties. So the, uh, oops, I'm sorry. So back to SolidWorks here. So for those of you who are interested in uh, in drawings, if you if you have that scenario, if we have this as a sub assembly, and then we put this into the top level assembly, and we have the other uh, the, uh, the the body as a sub assembly, and we put it into the top level, we're going to have this extra part here that's going to show up in the bill of materials. And you know we don't want that. We don't want to see this master layout part in our bill of materials. There's nothing to manufacture from that. Well, what we can do is right mouse button on that master layout part, and we can go to component properties. And then down here at the bottom of component properties, we can say exclude from bill of materials. And that way the master model layout part won't show up in the bomb. So we'll check that option on and we'll make sure that we do that every time we use that part. And uh, now we can see, uh, yep, that's good. Uh, yeah, the, the, so Antivenom is commenting on what I what I wrote there. Yeah, the problem is uh, when you get into equations, you can you can. You can put yourself into a circular reference, and it's not just with, um, uh, you know, it's not just with like uh, numeric values, but it's things like a hole diameter. So like this hole equals this bolt, and this bolt equals this hole size, and this hole size equals this bolt size, and it's especially when you don't have both files open at the same time. So when you've got, you know, the, the um, when you've got, let's say, let's say in that scenario, you've got a bolt here and that bolt is going into a hole here 
and the diameter of the bolt equals the diameter of that hole. And then you close that assembly. So that's assembly one. And then you open assembly two. And in assembly two, you've got the same bolt, but you've got a different hole. And then in assembly two, you say, you know, somehow you say that the, the bolt diameter is equal to this hole. You know, now you bring those two sub-assemblies together in a top-level assembly, and SolidWorks is like, what are you trying to do? You can't have both. And then it's trying to figure out which one to solve, and then it takes a long time for the assembly to open. So that's, that's a little bit more of a, you know, real-world uh, scenario where that kind of stuff can crop up. All right, so we, uh, in our master model layout sketch, we did create a sketch that represents the, the truss rod information. I think we're going to need to put just a little bit more information in here. I don't know um, everything about truss rod design, so uh, this is going to be a little bit, um, uh, let's say, <laughs> fictitious. Uh, but I'm going to say that it sits here underneath the nut by about 60 thou. And I'm going to say that uh, the uh, the block that's up at the top is one inch long. One inch long. Sometimes I'll leave little love notes in here for myself. So I'll call this like truss rod block. And that way, if I'm not sure what the layout sketch is representing, uh, I'll, you know, this will be truss rod hex head location. Um, if I'm not sure what it's representing, then I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll leave myself with these little notes. Um, and then... I'll create another set of lines down here that represent the end of the truss rod. So this one will just go right from tangency to tangency. And then this one will come across to here. And then this will be called, uh, we'll call this one one inch as well. And then this will be called truss rod block as well. Okay. So now our goal is to create a sub-assembly that represents that um, uh, truss rod. We need to put a truss rod subassembly in here. So let's save this assembly. Let's open up this master model layout part. Let's go file make assembly from part. This is kind of the same idea of using the master model to drive a subassembly. So we're going to add that master model layout part here as our subassembly, and then we're going to say save, and we're going to call this one RBG three thousand one truss rod assembly, and then we're going to go insert component new part. And we're going to say this is going to be called uh, RBG301 Truss Rod. Um, I'm going to call this um, Main Bar and Blocks. I'm going to just put the Main Bar and the Blocks together because, again, I don't really know what I'm doing here uh, when it comes to Truss Rod creation. kind of winging it. So Main Bar and Blocks, we're going to say, are welded together. I shouldn't do it that way. I should just do the main bar. Trust rod main bar. Save. Um, hit the front plane because that's where we always start. Exit that sketch. Uh, create a new sketch plane that is going to be at the uh, location of the truss rod. And so we're going to say the truss rod is just going to sit right on top, right underneath the fretboard. So I'm going to drag this up to, say, this point here. Really, it's this point here. So that's that's our top of neck plane. So this is uh, top face of neck plane. Uh, select this face, begin a sketch, orient the view, and we are going to sketch a line that goes, or sorry, a, really it should go to this point here. Let's see, that's where the, that screw is, that's where the block is. This is welded onto the block, so it's probably like here. Say that's going to be short thing, Raju. Good seeing you in here again, my man. All right, so we'll say that's going to be a 0.375, and make sure that gets hooked onto there. Okay, extrude. This is going to be 0 0.25. That looks very thick for that bar. Let's make that 0 0.125. Much better. Really, it's probably even smaller than that. 0 0.090. I like it. Okay, and then we're going to assign a material to that, and that material is going to be plain carbon steel, and that is our truss rod component. Now, insert component, new part, and this new part is going to be RGB-302 uh, truss rod bottom block. Okay, this is going to go to the front plane of our assembly, 
exit that sketch. We're going to go on to the right plane of our part, right plane of our new part here, right plane, begin a sketch. And we're going to create a sketch of a block that starts at the bottom of the truss rod here and comes over like so. It's going to be point, let's just make this 0.25 for depth. And then for our width, we're going to say that that's going to be coincident to this point. So we'll say coincident S key extrude up to vertex for direction one and for direction two, we're going to go up to vertex as well. And that's going to be there. And we will make that out of plain carbon steel as well. I don't really know if these are plain carbon steel or aluminum. They're probably aluminum for the sake of weight, but um, I'm going to make them out of plain carbon steel. Insert component, new part. Uh, this is going to be RGB-303 truss rod top block. And this is going to go front plane of the assembly, immediately exit that sketch, go to the right plane of that new part, begin a sketch, and we're going to create another rectangle here, which is going to once again be referenced to the bottom of that truss rod, will once again be 0 0.25, and we'll go to, say, this distance here, we don't know what that distance is, pick this, um... yeah, pick this point here. Uh, and this point coincident pick this line and this point coincident extrude up to vertex in direction one and for direction two that is going to go up to vertex as well that's going to go up to vertex on this side okay and now this one's going to have a hole through it because that's going to be the hole for the truss uh the, the truss rod nut so maybe we could just do a corner to corner here to get this midpoint. And then we'll throw a diameter on this of uh, 0 0.1875. Say. Well, that looks a little bit too big. Uh, I'll just make it 0 0.125. Extrude cut, right mouse button, through all, right mouse button, finish that. Okay, that's the truss rod top block. And then uh, finally, we'll have the uh, threaded truss rod screw. So we'll say um, insert component, new part. And this is going to be RBG-304 threaded truss rod screw. And this is going to go front plane and then immediately exit that sketch. And uh, for this one, we could, we really could just once again go to the right plane um, and just kind of draw this thing in as a revolve. So usually I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a revolve quite uh, at this extreme, but I think this is fine. So we're going to come all the way down to here. Uh, and then the head of this thing is a little bit on the longer side. Uh, so make the head something like that. And then the center of that is going to be the center of that hole so that those two are aligned. And we'll come down to here. We'll make that guy horizontal. And we will give ourselves a center line like so. And then we will say that the, let's show this sketch, that this and this are coincident so that those are always aligned. We'll say that this to the center line and across is 0 0.125. And we'll say that this to the center line and across is 0 0.25, a little bit big there. And uh, this, the head of the the um, the underside of the head of the screw is aligned to there, and then the uh, the top part of the head of the screw is going to be aligned to this point. A lot of times you have to rotate the view a little bit to get those to align. So we'll make that coincident, and then we'll go features revolve. There we go. Maybe throw a hex cut on the top here. Let me hide this sketch. We don't need that one anymore. Throw a hex cut here on the uh, top of this thing. Wake up the center point. Drop in a hex cut. There we go. Take that and make it horizontal to the center. And give ourselves a flat, flat distance. Good enough for what we're doing here. Okay, and then maybe even like a little, it definitely has a chamfer around the outside, so I'm going to add that just because I think it'll look cool. And we'll make that 30 thou. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, good, good enough. Uh, let's make sure we get a material to that. I think I might have missed the material on one of them. Uh, let's make this out of plain carbon steel, mix it up a little bit. And 
let's uh, exit that and now we can right mouse button on our master model layout go to properties say that we want to exclude that from the bill of materials say that we want to hide that master model layout hide that component we don't need to see that anymore boom there's our truss rod assembly good enough for what we're trying to accomplish here let's save that truss rod assembly let's go over to our data management system and make sure that we get that added into our uh, data management project here truss rod assembly is being added in here all looks good check in everything's going into the correct spot and then <coughs> well when I, I got so excited when i breathed in i breathed in a little bit of my coffee um and then what we're going to do is save this and go to our top level assembly Really, we could just go to the neck assembly. So we'll go to the neck assembly here. And then this is the cool thing. When we go insert component, all we have to do is pick on that trust rod assembly and hit the green check mark. And SolidWorks is going to drop that into exactly the right spot. See, there it is, exactly in the right spot. And the reason SolidWorks was able to do that is because everything is designed from the same master model layout. So all we had to do was just hit that green check mark and boom, we got ourselves a truss rod embedded in this assembly. We can uh, go to the master model layout, make sure it's excluded from bomb. We could hide that master model layout and look at that thing. That's looking good. Yeah, I like it. Now there's probably uh, a, a little bit more work that needs to be done on the truss rod. I'll, I'll do that at some point, uh, you know, adding some threading in and, and uh, you know, this actually probably the head probably doesn't come all the way down because it needs room to thread to get uh you know more and less so you know I'll, I'll get in there and do that sometime offline um i don't really like quite how shiny this part is here so i'm gonna just go to this part and go to its material so i click on the little beach ball and i go to appearance and then i'm gonna go to metal and just make this a little bit less shiny there we go i like that a little more yeah much better okay save if i was to check this in again we would see uh that only the parts that have changed are actually being checked in so you notice the highlighting it's everything is not highlighted only certain components are highlighted so that's all that needs to go in there okay so check that in go to our neck assembly yeah that looks good i like it happy with that okay so now we're ready to move on to our fretboard, which is going to be part of the neck assembly. So let's get into the fretboard now. Let's show our master model uh, layout again. Uh, the, the, the main thing about the fretboard to be aware of is that it does have a radius across the top. Um, it's, not, it's not flat all the way up here. If we look at this from the end, you can see it pretty clearly there. So looking in from the end, there is definitely a radius on this thing. Um, these radius are there. You can often find out what the radius is by looking at the manufacturer's specification. We're going to more or less eyeball it up for, for this, uh, exercise today, but, uh, it is radius and you know, you can see that it also tapers as we're going up to the top. It remains a pretty uniform thickness, uh, looking at it from this side. So I think what we could do is we could create a line, an arc across the top, another line and a straight line across the bottom. And then we could sweep with guide curves. Uh, to get that up to the top to give ourselves the uh, the overall shape of the neck. Sometimes the neck has the fretboard has a variable radius where it's one radius up at the top and then it, it gradually changes to a different radius. Um, so you know I don't think that's that's what's happening here, uh, but uh, just be aware that that is sometimes the case. This one looks like it's relatively flat across the bottom too. Sometimes they're curved on the bottom. They have some additional geometry. And um, I think the other thing we could probably do would be just to loft between two profiles so we could create a profile up here and a profile down at the bottom and then loft between them so we got some options as far as how we're going to uh, create this this fretboard uh, but let's start out by going to the master model and putting some of that geometry directly into the master model to make it a little bit easier for us to uh, to you know maybe start from the same master model in the future uh, and make a different bass or a different guitar you know, from that same master model, you know, why not, why not give ourselves the ability to reuse that same master model? So I'm going to start here by going to the front plane, hold control, drag, and I'm going to drag down to this point here. And then I'll call that uh, bottom face of, or I'll call it, sorry, plane, bottom face. Oh boy. Sorry guys. Here we go. 
So I'm going to start by going to the uh, the master model uh, part file here. So I went back to the master model part file. Um, and again, what we're trying to do is create this, this fretboard. So once we get into the master model, it's just a single part file here, the master model. First thing I'm going to do is take the front plane, hold control, and drag the front plane down, and then pick this point here. And uh, now that we're down to that lower section... Now that we're down to that lower uh, location, I can rename that plane, and I can call that plane bottom of fretboard. Question from Anti Venom uh, it says, "Bro, what's your favorite scene in SolidWorks? I ride the plane white mostly. Yeah, I'm a plane. I like the plane white as well. I think that uh, really works well, especially if you're doing any kind of rendering or outputting uh, PNGs of uh, of parts that have real view turned on. So, I can definitely get on board with that, Anti Venom." All right, so now now that we're down at the bottom here, maybe just rotate the view a little bit. We're going to start a sketch. Uh, we're going to try and pick up on that point there. Bring a line directly across. That was supposed to be horizontal. Bring a line up and then create our three-point arc. And I don't really know what this radius is, so I'm going to just drop it in here and then make that dimension driven. Driven. And uh, then I'm going to take this point and... This, maybe, this point, make those coincident, and I'll take this point and this point and make those coincident. Now those two are aligned, and uh, I'll take this point and this point and make those horizontal, and then we will say that the distance to here is, let's measure this. like about 0 0.165 and then at the peak radius 0 0.25 so 0 0.165 and then at the peak radius so from here to here look at that 0 0.25 okay and so we can exit that sketch and then up at the top here so once again we'll take the front plane hold control drag and we will take this point right here where it stops and so this one will be called plane top of fretboard and then we can on that plane begin a sketch and basically do the same thing um, we can say that we want to create a line that really what it should probably do is pierce here just so that the the geometry is consistent so pierce here and then this was what did i say it was 0 0.165 and bring this up so it's horizontal. And then let me just confirm that that's the same up top. Looks pretty uniform, so yeah. yeah that's it's the same. And then I think it's probably the same radius all the way up. I mean, maybe. Maybe it tapers down just a little bit, um, and maybe just for sake of this exercise, we'll do that. So we'll say that from here to here, it's uh, 0 0.22 instead of 0 0.25. Not much, but just a little. Okay, and then we can uh, rename that one to layout bottom of fretboard, and we can rename this one to layout top of fretboard. And then um, we could take all these and just add them to a folder, and we could say this is my fretboard folder so that I know that anything that's related to the fretboard shows up in that folder. We're going to have more stuff to add into the fretboard. Um, and then we can go sketch color, and we could say for our fretboard, everything is going to be green. It's going to be our green, green features here. So we go sketch color, and we make that green. We got our bottom. We got our top of the fretboard. Let's save, and let's return to our neck subassembly. And now for our next subassembly, we're going to go insert component new part and we go into our component new part this one's going to be called rbg-202 um fretboard fretboard okay and then we're going to pick the front plane of this uh assembly i hit the green check mark immediately exit the sketch uh, we could go to our master model layout part and we could take that plane that we created at the bottom and we could do S key reference geometry plane offset at zero. That gives us the bottom of the fretboard. We can go to our master model layout part, take that top one, S key reference geometry plane 
offset at zero. That gives us the top plane for our fretboard lo uh, loft. We can go to that first plane there, begin a sketch, right mouse button on one of these green entities, select chain, convert entities, exit sketch. We can go to our second plane that we created here, begin a sketch, right mouse button on one of these green entities, select chain, convert entities, uh, exit sketch. And now we've set ourselves up for a nice loft between those two. So here in our fretboard uh, component, you can see that we are now set up to loft from this profile to this profile and boom that gives us our fretboard let's go to material um i don't know if we're gonna have a rosewood in here let's see no no rosewood uh let's go with a let's go with an oak <laughs> i think that's uh like let's just go with a mahogany for now okay that gets close enough all right there we go that looks pretty good for our fretboard um, definitely will will pass the muster and now that's been added to our sub assembly our next sub assembly so we can see here uh oh what's going on with this we're too low yes we are definitely too low that's not good let's see what did we do wrong let's go to our master model and we are too low yes we are definitely too low so for this one, we're going to edit this first sketch here, and this is not going to be coincident here. It's not going to be coincident here. We're going to move this up. It's going to be vertical. It's going to be vertical. And it's going to be coincident to this. There we go. That should solve that one. And for the other one, it'll just be a smidge more tricky. Uh, because of the pierce so edit sketch get rid of the pierce get rid of the pierce move this whole thing up uh, make a couple of construction lines so construction line here construction line here but those are vertical this is going to be pierced here so it lands in the correct location this is going to be pierced here and then this is going to be i guess i could just make it collinear to this one because it is supposed to be straight up because it's kind of like before we've bent it with the truss rod. So exit that sketch, return to the fretboard. Good, looks good. Return to the neck sub-assembly. Let's hide that master model part. Oops, nope, not edit, hide. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that looks good. Wow. Oh, I love being able to see that... Uh, a truss rod in there that like that makes it now that's going to be under the nut so you're, you're not really going to be able to see it and that's that's how it is in the uh in the physical model too it's it's kind of hidden there under the nut that's hard to see in this in this light but yeah i'm happy that's for sure all right so let's now uh let's create some fret slots fret fret slots uh, so that we can drop our frets into this thing. And again, we're going to kind of make some assumptions here. We're going to assume that uh, all the fret slots are in the, uh, uh, or, or uh, exist at the same depth. Um, I mean, really, it is fret wire that you lay in there. So it probably should, uh, it probably should follow that same curve. We may need to think about that a little bit. Let's see what we can do here. So we're going to go to uh, our cut extrude. You know, ba basically what we need here is we need a cut extrude that is it's small, six sixty thou, seventy thou, uh, for where the fret sticks down in the fret. The fret itself, if you look at it from the side, it kind of looks like a T. So it comes over, it comes down into that little slot. It comes over, it comes over like this. And then it, it tapers up like so, kind of like a, a mouse cursor. And then down like that. And then this distance here is our 70 thou. 0 0.070 inches, 70 thou. So, um, and then we want that to go down to a distance so 70 thou and then we want that to go down to a distance of about all 
or I'm sorry, I not seventy thousand zero 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 seven seven thou. It's really thin. We want that to go down to a distance of about eighty thou. Um, so let's take a look here at at uh, what that might look like if we open this part, and then from this part file we say take the top. Uh, top plane and drag it up just a distance of one inch. So we're just creating a new sketch plane here that is above the um, So this is uh, plane lower loft profile This is plane upper loft profile loft uh, main fretboard and This is plane above fretboard for cuts select face begin to sketch orient the view and now we have to create a set of geometry that can be patterned uh, throughout the entire fretboard so I think in order to make this something that can be patterned I'll have more luck if I start out by taking this face and doing an offset surface so I'm going to offset this to 0 0.080 and reverse the direction. So what I just did there was I took just that face. See, I took just that face that was on top of the, um, the, the top face of the fretboard. I took just that face and I offset just that face down 0 0.080. And uh, now I'm going to extend all around that face. So I'll extend it by one inch all around. Let's see, it doesn't like that. I really only need this edge and this edge. I don't need the top and the bottom, so maybe I'll have more luck there. Okay, there we go. And so um, let me change the color of that surface just so it's a little bit easier for everybody to identify uh, the surface there. So I'll drag this color onto that body. So that's a surface that exists at the depth that I want all of my cuts to exist at. And the reason that I did that is because I think that's going to set me up for more success when I go to pattern the cut. So now I'm going to create a cut extrude here that is 0 0.007. Wow, that is small. Okay, and then that's going to come down from the bottom of the, the nut to... Really, I should go to the center of that slot. Um, so let me make this... I'll make that one midpoint and then I'll create another line here that goes across the slot and then I'll create a point at the midpoint of that. So it's at the very center of the fret that that point that I just selected to dimension is at the very center of the fret. And now this is going to be the location of my first fret. So now the question is, what is that distance supposed to be? So, you know, I could certainly measure that distance. I could take a measurement from the bottom of the nut uh, to that first fret and just kind of eyeballing it up here. It looks like that distance is 1.709, 1.709. Okay, that's good, 1 point, oops, 1.709. All right, no problem, got it. And then um, I can say that I want this distance here to be you know, wider than the very bottom of the model. So I could say I want that to be three. Okay, so it's wider than the very bottom of the model. And then I can do an extrude cut and I'll double click on this surface. So the extrude cut goes up to surface and there is my first fret groove. Um, and then ideally I can take that first fret groove and I can perform a pattern uh, and that pattern will go in this direction, and it will be at uh, 1.71, and I will uh, reverse the direction of that pattern and drop this in here at, you know, all the way down to the bottom. And there we go. Boom, we got all of our frets. Looks good, right? But the problem is that that is not how frets are actually spaced, and we can see that if we look at our uh, image of the bass guitar from the very top. So if we look at this picture of the bass guitar from the top, and then we change to a wireframe here, we can see these black lines are the frets in the pattern that we just created, and the the, the, the image shows us where the frets are actually supposed to be. So we get this black line here. I mean, I'm not so worried about the first one not lining up, but it's the fact that as we go further down the neck, the spacing gets smaller, and I'm not accounting for that in my linear pattern. 
So we need to revise. Um, and what we will learn if we do a little bit of research uh, on the inter internet, on the interwebs, what we will learn is that there is a formula that you can utilize when you are uh, looking for your uh, fret spacing. So the formula here is you take the distance from the nut and that's going to equal the scale length uh, divided by 2 to the power of the number of frets divided by 12. Uh, that is how you determine your scale length. So in this case, our scale length is... Crap, I forget what it is. Uh, I think it's 22... Uh, I forget what Hold on a second. Let me measure. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. So it's thirty-two inch scale length, uh, smaller than a standard bass guitar, uh, which I think I think a standard b electric bass guitar has the same scale length as a cello. Uh, just a little fun knowledge there for you. But we're gonna say this one is thirty-two. So look, that's kind of interesting. I typed in thirty-two there, and look, our distance to the first fret is one point seven nine six. So that's excellent. That's you know that's exactly what we came up with when we took a measurement on the neck. So that lets us know that we're kind of in the right direction. So this is going to be 32 uh, all the way down here for all of these. And there we go. That 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 gave us uh, the distance from the nut. So the distance from from the nut to the center of the fret for all of our frets. So now the question is, how many frets do we have? One, two, three. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20. We have 20. We have 20 frets. Uh, so the, uh, let's see here. So N in this formula, let me just make sure that my N here is. Oh, oh, duh. Yeah, it's to the location of the fret. It doesn't matter how many I have. But we only have 20. So we don't need anything beyond this. We just need. We just need those 20 frets to give us our location. So our final location here should be about 21.92. So now the question is, how do we get this information into a pattern? And the answer to that question is we can use a special pattern type. So not linear pattern. We can use a special pattern type here called variable pattern. So when I do variable pattern, what I can do is I can say, this is my feature to pattern. My fret is going to be my feature to pattern. And then I can do what's called create a pattern table. And so here you can see we've got our pattern table here. And what's cool about the pattern table is we can actually copy and paste directly from Excel into the pattern table. Now, the one thing you need to do ahead of time is you need to add instances to the pattern. Uh, otherwise, this, this will not work. So we can add instances to the pattern here. Uh, we're going to take this down to 20. All right, there we go. We're able to take that down to 20. And uh, and then we are going to say that our, see here, it says select dimensions from the graphics area. Select dimensions from the graphics area and add them to this table. So the dimension that we wish to vary is this dimension here, the 1.7. Uh, 1.7, 1.71. That should be 1.79. I wonder if it's taking it from like the top of the the nut. Well, anyhow, that's the dimension we want to vary, and we're going to take the remainder of our Excel spreadsheet here. So all the remaining numbers here, we're going to copy all those remaining numbers, and we're going to paste them here. Let's see here. Uh, it's not valid to paste in this location. Let's try it like this. Hmm. Let me go. Let me just grab a few. I'm just gonna grab. I'm just gonna grab a subset of those numbers just to see if it uh, if it still fails here. Okay, there we go. That worked. So that got me down to ten. I think I may be running out of room at the bottom. Whoops. So Control C, and then come over here. Control V. Okay, they got me down to 16.898. Control C. Control V. They got me down to 20. Oh, 
Oh, I see what's happening here. I have row one, two, three are not really used. So we go 21, 22. Okay, there we go. Control C and Control V. And so then here in the background, there's this button that says update preview. And look at that. Now it's looking like an actual fretboard. How cool is that, huh? So we say OK. And hit the green check mark. And boom. We got ourselves a fretboard pattern. Yes. Very nice. Very happy with that result. So now the question is, you know, how much do we want to put into uh, the fretboard as far as it being a single part, maybe like a multi-body part, uh, or do we want to include the frets maybe at the uh, at the assembly level uh, as you know as part of like the next sub-assembly? The frets are technically their own component, but you do typically buy the fretboard all as one piece. Uh, there's not a lot of people that are like really. I mean, you do refret the fretboard. You know, I'm kind of on the fence here. I almost want to like inlay the the inlays in this part, and then uh, have the frets be their own separate parts. But I think what we'll probably end up doing is just making the frets their own part, and then using a um, probably just using the same approach for the frets. Um, you know, I just feel almost like at that point. I mean, there's there's a couple of different ways we could do it. The other thing we could do is we could do a uh, like a, a pattern driven pattern at the assembly level. The problem is that if we do that, then we're going to have to sit there and, and like trim off all of the individual frets. And so it's better just to have all the frets in one single part file. So oh, yeah, 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 I don't know what to do. All right. Well, first of all, let's just get this dimension to be correct. Uh, 1.796. 1.796 should be that first dimension. So let's go to this cut here and make sure that that is 1.796 for that first distance so that our distance is correct on all of our frets. And I think that looks pretty good for our fretboard. We'll call this one uh, fret cut one, and then we'll call this one variable pattern uh, fret cuts. I think maybe one thing I want to do before I move forward here is roll back to um, after I did that surface offset, but before I started doing those cuts and just add a fillet down each side of the fretboard here uh, because it is rolled off. It's not, it's not sharp on the edges there. Yeah, that looks better. Frets are installed larger and trimmed. It is handcrafted. Yeah, that's exactly right, Jason O. Um, you got it exactly right. And that's that's where, like, I don't really know, um, you know, the, the frets are so integrated with this part file here. Uh, and, and because the manufacturing is, you know, is done after, I, I'm very tempted to just include it directly in this part file. Um, so I think since that's what my instinct is saying to do, I think that's what... I think that's what I'm going to do. I don't know. I, I'll do it as its own part. Forget it. I'll just do it as its own part. All right. All right. So save. And let's return to our neck sub-assembly. Let's see how we're doing so far here. Hide component. Okay. And yes, that is looking good. Oh, sorry. We were going to look at the uh, fret spacing and see how it looks compared to the image. So let's go to... Really, we should probably go to the neck Sub okay, that's where we are. And so we could hide this. Um, we could hide this, the image from the top. And we could maybe show the neck only on the top. So let's show that. And then let's look at this thing in wireframe. So yeah, now that's looking better. Uh, it is surprisingly off as we get closer to the bottom here. Wow, it's weird. It gets back on at the bottom. Did I count the number of frets wrong or something? One... Or measure the scale length wrong. Let's see. So that's that's interesting. I feel like that's way too far off uh, compared to our calculation. It's almost like it's it's off by one full full fret. That's like what it looks like. That's interesting. 
I'll uh, I'll research that tonight uh, in some off time and see if I can't figure out why that's so far off. Uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't be too much of a hindrance on what we're trying to do here. So so let's go to our uh, next component. So we're gonna say insert component new part, and this is gonna be R G B three zero four fret wire, or I'll just call it frets. Save. And we're going to go front plane and then immediately exit that sketch. And for this one, we're going to be referencing some of the geometry from the fretboard. So I'll start out by taking that plane that I created. Or actually, sorry, I'll start by taking that surface that I offset and doing a surface offset command. So this will be offset at zero. And we'll call that one um, surface offset from fretboard. And then we're going to, um, we should probably take that same surface and bring it up to, let's change the color of that. We should probably take that same surface and bring it up to the overall height of the, um, of the fretboard. So that surface was originally offset down. What did I say, 80 thou? Yeah, 80 thou. So we should probably take this and offset it back up. Like so. And then we should do our... Boy, this is going to be a real pain. <laughs> I'm just thinking about this in terms of like how to... Because we get, we're gonna have the same problem with the pattern, uh, creating the pattern across this thing. Trimming it won't be too hard, but uh, this is gonna be one point zero. Uh, this is gonna be plane above fretboard, and then we're gonna go to that plane, begin to sketch, orient our view, and we're gonna say that this is going to be. May as well make this one first. Zero point zero zero seven. Uh, by what did I say 2.5 or 3 I think it's a 3 4 and then we're going to say that that's going to have a midpoint to midpoint center line and that we're going to have a point on there and this is going to be vertical to the origin or coincident to the origin and then that center point is going to be dimensioned at 1.796, that first location. And then uh, that is going to get extruded up to surface. And then that is going to get cut with this surface. Okay, so that gives us that lower fret section. And now from that plane above the fretboard, we're going to create another rectangle. Could probably show this and then do center point rectangle. And this fret at the bottom is going to be Zero point one zero nine wide, um, and then this will be two point five as well, or three, whatever we made it before, three wide, and that is going to get extruded up to surface here, and a merging result, so it merges into the lower, uh, lower part of that, and then that is going to be offset to cut that uh, to a height of. Let's say 0 0.075. And then that is going to be cut. With surface. In the other direction. Okay, I know that that might have seemed like a lot of work just to create this shape, but uh, the, the, the reason I'm doing it this way is because I want to be able to repeatedly pattern this uh, down the length of, of, the, um, 
of the fretboard and I don't want the pattern to fail. So you're correct if you're thinking like, wow, that looked like a lot of work just to make that shape. But uh, the reason we did it that way is because we're trying to set ourselves up to have kind of like a robust uh, approach to creating the uh, creating the pattern. So now, oh, you know what? I think I did this before and it didn't work because you can't do variable pattern with a body. Um, so I think I might have to do some kind of a hack to, to get this all together, like make a, uh, an extrusion that runs like from here all the way down. So let, let's see what happens. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but uh, let's go back to, I'm going to just show this original shape again here. So let's take this guy and go features, variable pattern. And then what are we going to pattern? We're going to pattern all of this. Boss extrude, surface cut. Selected seed is not supported. Select another seed. Okay, I might have to redo that cut. Um, that's interesting. Surface cut to chamfer. Mm, 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 I don't like this too much. I do not like this too much at all. Add these 20 rows. Take this. Uh, take this dimension. Take this from my Excel spreadsheet. Copy and paste. I guess I don't need this one. Cannot create variable pattern, yeah. Hmm. It's all good, guys. We're not we're not freaking out or anything. We're just we're just thinking. Just thinking in our brain. Let's say I did create an extrusion here. Just a small extrusion. It goes up to vertex. Okay. And then we try this again. Variable pattern. What are we going to be patterning? We're going to be patterning the, the fret wire and the top part of the fret and the chamfer. Hopefully. Uh, create pattern table. So this is going to add 19 to the pattern table. Take these values here, copy, and we're going to pattern based on this dimension here. Paste. Cannot create variable pattern. Let's get rid of some of this stuff. Wow, it doesn't even like it with just the, the first extrusion there. Yeah, I, I, I feel like when I've done this in the past, I had to, I ran into this kind of stumbling block where the uh, the pattern wouldn't create because it was multi-body. And so I had to get clever. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. Let's see if, uh, see if this works any better. See, it doesn't even like that. Just the one single, one single instance it doesn't even like. Now, why is that? That's the question. That's the real question I'm wondering here is why is it that it doesn't like that one single instance? Is it because... Is it because I went up to surface? It, it can't be that, right? Because the other one worked fine, even though I went up to surface. So let's just try to let's try to iteratively troubleshoot this. This is something we did a lot of in tech support. Is you know, let's try to figure out why it wouldn't want to do just one single instance of this pattern to three. Let's update preview. Cannot create variable pattern. Just all I'm doing is creating a linear pattern of that boss extrude that goes up to surface from 
location one to location two, and it's saying no. There's no dimension specified. Well, I created the dimension here. In this one, we want that to be, let's say we want it to be four. Update preview. No. It says, no, I don't like that. Now, why? That's the question. Why doesn't it like that? It's connected, right? It's a, it's a connected feature. Is it because, maybe it's because this uh, came, because this is part of that face. Let's see, if I do um, edit sketch plane and put this on the front plane of the design, now it's just kind of ripping through. And then let's even make this, let's change the order of these. Can I put this down below here? Can I put this above? Probably because merge result, yeah. Okay. So let's put this first. And then let's make this merge result. Okay, good. And then let's try again now. So now what we do is we change the we changed the order of that feature, but but we may have also changed the dependency a little bit in doing that. And this is just, you know, this is just kind of iterative troubleshooting here. The the lesson that we're learning here is that sometimes if you do, look at that, now it worked. Sometimes if you do some iterative troubleshooting, you can kind of get yourself out of a jam. So in this case, I was able to get that to work because of uh, the order of feature creation and probably like the merge result dependency. The merge result of that boss extrude was dependent on that, um, on that uh, uh, fret that I created there. So now let's move forward. Now let's see what's going on with this surface cut. So the surface cut that I created was to this top surface here. Now those are merged. So what's gonna happen with the surface cut now? It doesn't like operation failed due to geometric condition, okay? Well, can we maybe resolve that by extending the surface out a little bit more in both directions? Uh, let's see here, extend surface. Maybe there's something going on here where it doesn't like that, that end being right there. Okay, now let's see what surface cut does. Surface cut, edit feature. Let's see, so our surface offset needs to be Surface offset from end. Let's take this surface and offset it. Offset surface 0 0.075. And then see the problem here is that all of these are going to be, mm, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see what happens. This should be, actually be 0 0.08. And we're going to say cut with surface and we'll pick this guy here reverse direction and okay that did cut now let's again iterative troubleshooting let's let's try to pattern it again with variable pattern so we go variable pattern and we say we're going to pattern oh but we can't we can't pattern the surface cut it doesn't like the surface cut so that doesn't actually help us. We actually need to do the pattern first and then do the surface cut. So we would do, okay. And we've already established that we can do the variable pattern on that component uh, with the, you know, uh, with the surface cut happening later. So, so I mean, I guess let's just do it, right? Let's just, let's just do it. So let's do uh, create pattern table. And we'll say this is our dimension and we'll say there's going to be 20 or sorry, 19 additional instances. And then let's paste all those different uh, distances. Let's do update. Now it's saying all these instances failed. Well, that's kind of sucky. But didn't we just test this like two seconds ago? It worked. What the heck? What What is going on here? The only thing that we did different was a surface offset. Variable pattern. This guy.
create pattern table, this dimension, 19, add those, paste, update preview. What the? That, I, uh, I'm speechless. I have no idea why, uh, why it worked this time, uh, and last time it didn't work just because all we did was add a surface offset. That's crazy. Okay, that's fine. It's it's all good. Let's let's keep going. All right, so now I'll take this surface offset and uh, surfaces cut with surface and reverse direction. And uh, this is going to be... Oh, this is probably another one where we have to extend it, right? So we did surface extend, surface offset. Let's take that one, cut with surface, and in the up direction... There we go. All right. So that gives us the uh, the lower part of the fret that's sticking down in there. And now let's see if we can um, find the same success with the upper part of the fret. So this surface cut we don't need. This surface cut we don't need. There's the boss extrude for the upper part of the fret. Now let's see if we can take that and do... Um, we actually want to put a dimension on that one. So instead of this being coincident to the other fret, so we'll get this. Where's the coincident? I think it's that one. Or that one. Or that one. Whatever. <laughs> uh, make that vertical. And then give that an actual dimension to the center there. Uh, 1.79, whatever it was. 1.796. And that is at the midpoint of this. Okay. Um, now that gets extruded down to there. And then that will get... Wait, why is that not... Why are those not in line? Oh, because I dimensioned it to the wrong spot. That's why. This has to be... Top plane, sketch, convert... It's because after I um, after I did all those extends and whatnot, I changed the yeah. That's what it was. So this should be here. No, this should be here. Oh, good, a spline. One point seven nine six. Yeah, that's what we want. Okay, and then that extrusion, hopefully, can be variable patterned. Variable pattern, and it will be this dimension and 19 additional instances and paste in those instances, update preview. Okay. And then this surface will be uh, offset at 0 0.075 it was already in there I know and then this will be cut with surface and we will cut in the up direction all right and then we will get rid of all of our surface bodies we don't need any of these anymore so delete bodies um, and then the rest of this crap we don't need although the chamfers are still a value i wonder if we could do the chamfer before the variable pattern here and uh include it in the variable pattern i wonder if it would let us do that no because it comes after the cut so that's the that's the sacrifice we're gonna have to make um i guess we could maybe do the extrusion up to surface and then include it but i think i'm just gonna you know manually go through here and, and get the these edges
a little bit uh, mechanical and kind of a pain if I have to change the number of instances. So I think there's going to be a more elegant solution. I probably could have done my extrusion. Uh, I don't know how I would have done it. Not being able to include that surface cut really surprised me and kind of threw me for a loop. I probably would, would do it with like an up two in the other direction, but you know, it takes less than a minute. I can handle a little manual clicking. It's fine. Do a little, uh, whoops, do a little Control and middle mouse button here for pan. Another often underutilized shortcut. But a good one. All right. Good, 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 good. Save. Uh, we'll make this out of plain carbon. And we will go to our um, neck subassembly. So RGB, where's our neck subassembly? I guess we'll go to the top level. Let's open up our neck subassembly here. And then in our neck subassembly, we are going to uh, go to our fretboard. Nope, we're gonna exit the fretboard. We're gonna go to our frets, edit part. And we're gonna say top plane, begin a sketch. And we're gonna take the edges of the neck itself. So this sketch line here and this sketch line here. Really, I could probably just take this whole thing, right? Do a select chain. We've done it so many times with thin feature that now it's actually going to help us. So we could do uh, convert entities there. And um, then we can return to the frets part file. And now that we've got that convert entities, we can do an extrude cut. And that's going to be through all both. And we're going to flip side to cut so it cuts to the outside. And we're going to say keep all bodies. And there we go. There's our frets. It's just that easy. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it definitely is a bit of a, it was a bit of a challenge there to get those. But I think that in the end, you know, if we, um, if we look at this thing and we hide this component here, you know, it looks pretty good. I like that. Um, these need to be rounded off. So, uh, Probably a chamfer or even a curve here that starts, you know, starts at the, the bottom and, and comes all the way up. Um, if I did an edit part here and did uh, chamfer, you know, it might look something like that. Really, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be filed down together with the fretboard and, and it's going to have a nice uh, matching look there. But I think that if I were to go through and add that chamfer to all of them, unfortunately, I don't think I can chamfer multiple bodies simultaneously. So, like, I could do this side and this side. Um, and let's make that a little bit, just a little bit smaller. So, like, I could do those two sides, but I think that if I um, attempt to do this one as well, Edges from multiple bodies cannot be chamfered in a single feature. So, you know, I'll use the um, enter key to uh, to continue to chamfer these. So, like, I'll do this edge and this edge. Enter, enter, this edge, and this edge. Enter, enter, this edge, and this edge. Enter, enter, and so on and so on down the fretboard. And that is how I think I would approach creating the the neck subassembly um, and the fretboard for the neck subassembly. So let's do a check-in active document to get this geometry into our PDM system. Get, getting to have a lot of uh, a lot of components here during check-in. Uh, so we got some sub assemblies now, some sub sub assemblies. We got all kinds of good stuff in this uh, in this design. And then let's go to our top level and do the same thing. And we will both save and check in. So check in active document. So I think we made some pretty good progress there today. 
Um, we were able to get that truss rod created. We were able to get those frets created. I think this thing is looking pretty darn sharp. Uh, we are definitely getting closer and closer to having this thing complete. Of course, we got to work on the body. Um, we'll, we'll probably start working on that tomorrow. I mean, the final thing for the neck is just going to be to drop in those inlays. And then we got to get the machine tuners in here up at the top. We got to get the nut created. The nut should be pretty simple. It's just a, a regular, uh, you know, just a regular extrusion. But overall, man, I, I got to say, I think this looks really good. Um, you know, again, we would probably round this off a little bit more in the real world, have that match. If you get a bass or a guitar that doesn't, you know, hasn't been worked on properly, the frets are actually really sharp and it's, uh, it can be dangerous. It can be annoying to play. Uh, but overall, I got to say, I'm, I'm really happy with this. I'm glad we were able to get in and, and make some more refinements to the neck. I think the neck looks a lot more like the physical product now. Uh, we got the truss rod in there, which is pretty cool. A lot of times when people draw up a guitar, they, they don't include that truss rod. So I think it's pretty cool that we were able to get that in there. Um, yeah, I'm just using tab to hide there. So it's kind of cool having the truss rod in there right underneath the frets. Shift tab to, to show, to bring back some of these components that I hid. We got the, the fretboard with the the appropriate, hopefully the appropriate spacing. I'm going to look over this thing tonight and see if I can't refine that. Um, and I'll let you guys know tomorrow what I did. But um, that's it for today. I want to say thank you guys so much for joining me. I uh, hope you enjoyed that session. I think we were able to get a lot done. I'm very happy that we were able to get a lot done. As always, feel free to... Uh, feel free to take a screen capture of what we did here, what we accomplished today, getting these frets in here. Feel free to share that on social media. Let people know that we're doing some free training. Um, uh, Tambora Station says it perfect. Says the neck looks good one step at a time. Yes, indeed. Uh, it is some of this stuff just has to be mechanical. Um, when you, you know, when you really get into it, if I was manufacturing guitars all day, I would, I would take more time to figure out how to make this more of a repeatable process where it really didn't matter what the radius of the neck was or how many frets there were. I could just type in a few dimensions and boom, 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 go, go, go. And maybe eventually I'll do that. You know, maybe after we finish this base, we'll do another guitar and we'll see, you know, what we learned from this design and, and how we can use it in that future design. I'm sure that tonight I will be thinking over, uh, what we did today with those frets and with that pattern and, and maybe I'll come up with a more elegant way to do it and if I do I'll share that with you tomorrow as well uh, but overall I'm very happy with our progress up to this point I'm excited to keep plowing through this thing uh, I'll drop in the description of all the videos I'll drop the link to those pictures I'll probably make a short video just to announce that the pictures are in there too in case anybody wants to follow along with and uh, soon enough we're going to be working on the the body you know, making some of those those crazy variable chamfers around the outside of the body, adding the pockets for the electronics, adding in all the switches and everything. And before you know it, we're going to have a completed guitar here. So very excited to see how this thing goes. I want to thank you guys all so much for joining me again. Uh, be sure to uh, like, be sure to subscribe, be sure to watch all, all of the other videos on repeat so we can get the view counts up to a million. And uh, I will see you guys tomorrow morning, same time. I will uh, switch that next video over to public so that you get the appropriate notification. I forgot to do that today. Uh, and thank you guys so much. See you guys tomorrow.